Good morning, Rob. Sounds like you got some heavy hitters in there today. Oh, I'm not playing around, baby. <laughs> yeah, well, just you're right. Come, I didn't play around crap. either. On Friday, obviously, you just announced, uh, where I announced on Friday that I'm running for auditor. So good news out there, and I'm very excited about it. All right, Riley, any advice to give to Eric about a constitutional officer position? <clears throat> uh, prepare to drive a lot. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Uh, Tuesday night, I spoke at the Putnam County Lincoln dinner, and it was. I, I think I got home around one thirty in the morning. So, yeah, that sounds about right. Yep. But um, you know, keep the pedal to the metal. Keep working hard. Eric knows the ins and outs of legislature better than anybody. Which. Uh, being in the legislature and then going to a constitutional office um, really serves you well. It really does in understanding both sides of the equation. So, yeah, Also, I want to say happy birthday to Delegate John Hardy today. I think he turned a big 5-0 today, I think. Ah, yeah. All we the, got him some uh, free media there. Nice. The big 50, yeah. huh? Yeah. I remember that birthday 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Distantly. Uh, Rye, thanks for stopping in, man. Good Thank to see you, buddy. Thank you for buddy. having me. I know you've got places you got to get to. Thanks. Good Thank job, you. Riley. Hey, good luck out there, Eric. Thanks. All right. See you, man. That is uh, Treasurer Riley Moore, again, candidate for Congress. Uh, Eric, you made the decision to run for auditor. You made the announcement on Friday. Tell me why the position of auditor. Well, I'm running for the West Virginia auditor because I want to ensure that our state's finances are managed with the utmost integrity, efficiency, and transparency. And I don't know if you know this about me, Rob. Or, or Matt, but uh, my colleagues in the West Virginia House, they call me the chairman of freedom because I've always been a strong advocate uh, for the taxpayer, a watchdog. Uh, as the majority leader and as the previous finance chairman, you know, I, I orchestrated one of the largest tax cuts ever in West Virginia's history. I've provided relief for small businesses on their machinery, inventory, and equipment tax. I've exempted veterans uh, with any service disability of 90% or more from paying personal property taxes. And in years past, I helped our seniors and retirees by reducing the state income tax on Social Security. So I've been a strong advocate. I've been a fighter. There's nobody more stronger, more proven, or more committed to protecting the taxpayer. And that's why I believe that I have the financial management and the accounting skills to protect the taxpayers, and that's why I decided to announce. I had been thinking about it for several months, and I made that commitment on Friday, and I hope that the citizens will elect me as their next auditor. Now, Eric, there were rumors that you might be considering other constitutional offices as well. No, that's not true. None of those rumors were ever true? None of those rumors were ever true. Um, you know, Whenever I make a commitment, I make a strong commitment, and I and I totally announce it. So that's why I announced it on Friday. Very good. Now, uh, in regards to the feedback you've gotten from uh, the folks you've spent some time with in the legislature, and I know you've been in leadership for quite some time, what is the reaction you've gotten? Very happy, uh, but also sad. They would like to see me stay to maybe become the next speaker, but uh, once again, you know, and the citizens of the Eastern Panhandle, they know how strong I am when it comes to, you know, of, of being a, a strong advocate for them. And the auditor's role, there, I think there's four requirements that the taxpayers demand. And they demand uh, transparency, so I'm going to ensure transparency. And, and the members have seen this out, out of the years out of me. That's why they call me the chairman of freedom. But I want to ensure transparency. I want to make it a top pro priority to provide clear and accessible financial information to the public. I think the next thing that our citizens demand is to safeguard their dollars, their taxpayer dollars. So I'm pledging that I'm going to rigorously audit government spending to, in, to basically identify any inefficiencies and potential savings. And something that's near and dear to me, I want to root out fraud and corruption. Uh, so I'm going to investigate any allegations of financial wrongdoing uh, without bias and make those responsible accountable. And I think the next uh, requirement that taxpayers demand is uh, you know, just collaborate with other agencies. You know, try to achieve the best outcomes for our state. Make sure our agencies are working together to improve efficiency and effectiveness. And these are strong uh, leadership and qualities that I possess, and that's why I'm asking uh, our citizens to elect me as the next state auditor. Alonzo Perry. So J.B. McCuskey is uh, vacating the seat, and 
I know he added a few things to the office. Is there anything that you're preparing to uh, basically implement when you first get in? I know uh, you have said that you want to streamline some of the processes of uh, auditing. And um, do you have anything in mind or or kind of something rough that you want to implement? I mean, day one. Absolutely. On day one, I think it's very important. I've talked to other leaders around the state. Uh, The opioid settlement, I think there needs to be complete transparency of how, you know, how this money is being dispersed to counties and how that money is being spent. That's number one. I think that's uh, something else that's been near and dear to me is a grant transparency. We have hundreds and hundreds, and I'm talking millions and millions of dollars going out to not-for-profits and other agencies. I think the grant transparency oversight is is, is of great importance. It's a bill that uh, I worked on as the finance chairman and we got it passed, it's law, but uh, it's just now starting to take off. So I want to see some enhancements in that. But uh, those are two things that I think right off the bat that I can start working on. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Eric. How are you, sir? Good morning, Matt. Um, have you had an opportunity uh, to an, analyze the public integrity unit that the auditor's office has? And do you think that it's... Um, does it need to be expanded? It, it, it does, Matt, uh, tremendously. Keep in mind, right now, there's nothing in state code that precludes the auditor from auditing state agencies. Nothing. Nothing in state, in state code. Um, I believe that we need to get our own house in order. Now, right now, your auditor, um, you know, they, they're responsible for uh, financial accountability at all local levels of government. You know, they conduct audits on counties, municipalities, boards of education, et cetera. But we also need to do it at the state level. Uh, miss some, uh, there's a missed, uh, the news that is coming out with uh, problems uh, within DHHR, uh, Department of Highways. Those two big agencies receive a lot of federal dollars. They receive a lot of state dollars. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we Make sure that these two agencies are spending the taxpayers' dollars wisely and not giving all of us a black eye. But, uh, yes, that's something that I would like to do is pay closer attention to our state agencies as well and make sure that we clean up our own house. I, I think that's a unique aspect of the auditor's office is, is, is the public integrity unit. It has the teeth, the enforcement teeth, to go out uh, and you know prosecute elected officials for for you know stealing money or other right. or other issues whereas you know if you, you contrast that with the secretary of state's office they they monitor elections but they don't have the enforcement mechanism they have to just simply rely on the the local prosecutor to do that position and you're right and we also have a, a another committee called special investigations a lot of people have never heard of that committee within both houses but it is a joint committee that also works in tandem, hand-in-hand, with the auditor's office to prosecute any waste, fraud, and abuse. So there is a number that the auditor's office does publish. It's called 833 uh, West Virginia Fraud for any taxpayer to report any fraud that they see happening throughout the state. Yes, and I've I've worked with, with these entities and investigations entities, and they're top-notch. Um, yes. Uh, what got my interest is you talked about potentially auditing – or pro- pro- providing a mechanism to uh, to audit the opioid settlement funds. How do you see that going? Well, keep in mind also, uh, I've had several conversations with our current auditor and with our AG, Patrick Morrissey. Uh, they both agree that uh, we need to have complete transparency on that issue. And uh, it may be, it might happen before I get there, but uh, remember this, this seat here that we're running for, this constitutional seat for West Virginia Auditor, I would become the auditor in January of 25, but we actually, uh, most delegates and the state senators won't be seated until February of 25 because of the presidential election year. But uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to work on it and have input. If not, I'll move on to something else to root out more waste, fraud, and abuse. That's what I'm more wired for. Remember, as your finance chairman in years past, it was very hard to uh, do a lot of that because you're inundated with policy all the time. Plus, you've got to get the state budget out. But uh, I think with my accounting background, my financial management background, that's what I want to do is uh, clean up any waste, fraud, and abuse and root that out. 
Can you enlighten us as to your accounting and financial analysis background, sure. Eric? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my four-year, my undergraduate degree is in ec- economics with a uh, concentration in accounting. And then later in life, I received my MBA from Frostburg University. So I'm a Shepherd University graduate, and my MBA is from Frostburg University. And I had a lot of finance courses at, within my MBA program. Eric, how will campaigning for auditor affect your last year in the House as majority leader? Well, I'm dedicated to serving the citizens. I'm the majority leader, so my role is going to be is to uh, manage uh, possibly 90 Republicans, and I'll do that job with the utmost importance, just like uh, campaigning. I enjoy campaigning. I enjoy. I love this great state. I, I've, I've traveled all over this state. My wife and I were trying to become the first West Virginians to have traveled every road in the state. I love meeting people. I love talking to people about why I'm running, what I'm going to do, and uh, I just enjoy doing it. But uh, right now, I'm, I've got the. Uh, I'm raising a lot of money. I just had a fundraiser, and that's the most important part right now is raising the money to get your message out there. Does, and I don't know if this is any different one way or the other, so you'd have to enlighten me on this. Mm -hmm. Does knowing that you won't be the majority leader the next year, does it put you in a bit of a lame duck status with the other legislators for this year? No, I have the utmost respect down there. Uh, Like I said, they call me the chairman of freedom. Remember, we've got legislators that want to get bills across the finish line. They're going to need my help. And I'm committed to helping them. I'm committed to helping them get, uh, you know, answer any of their complaints, uh, help navigate uh, through the the whole legislative committee process. But uh, no, that's the role of the majority leader is to uh, make motions, be the traffic cop, take arrows for the speaker, make the speaker look good, uh, complaint department help help members out, and just manage the day to day four activities. That's what the majority leader does. And uh, I've, I've, I've felt honored, uh, like I said, uh, to uh, help the speaker in my capacity. I've been a strong leader all my life, and I just enjoy doing it and helping people. Eric, I think there were how many new delegates in the last election? Thirty something. Thirty something, yes. Right. Yes. So that's and and, and and keep in mind, this next election, you're going to see another void. You're going to see even more delegates. I mean, we're losing Espinoza, myself, John Hardy. Uh, possibly Amy Summers, Steve Westfall, Erica Storch, who came in with me, has already left. When I came in in 2010, there's only two members that are left in the West Virginia House. They've either moved on or, or they've uh, moved up or they've done other things. So, Is there any concern that you have as to so much veteran leadership leaving the Republican Party at uh, this next election? I'll be able to continue my leadership role to help benefit the Eastern Panhandle and we're going to get new members elected here in Berkeley County as well. And we've got some stellar new candidates or stellar new delegates, I should say, Mike Hike, Mike Hornby, Chuck Horse. Those guys are going to make a big difference. You're going to see them also ascend up into some of these stronger leadership roles. I just had this conversation with uh, Mike Hornby the, the other day and with Mike Hite, and, and I've talked to Charles Horse before in the past. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, – for, for the entire Eastern Panhandle. I really do. I want, you know, I misspoke when I said leaving the Republican Party. I meant leaving the House of Delegates no, I knew what you meant. in the Republican Party. Yeah. By the way, Mike Hornby is here, and he was looking through the glass, as you mentioned his name, as a potential future leader, and it did make him very happy. He smiled ear to ear. when you I, I see Mike possibly <laughs> leading the Education Committee. I mean, that's near and dear to his heart, but I think he could serve in any capacity, and he could do it very well. Uh, let's talk about some of the major issues you'll uh, face in this next uh, delegate year, uh, Eric, when you folks go back. I know you just came from interims, and you'll have another interim session, what, in October? Uh, I'm sorry, October, November? Right, right. right. Uh, what are some of the main issues you're hoping to get across the line as you go back in January? Well, if you're speaking, if you're asking me what I'd like to see done. I am. Okay, good. I would like to see uh, corporate uh, uh, net income tax reform. I'd like to see us reduce the rates on that. Remember, my mind is guaranteed to be an advocate for the taxpayer when it comes to their hard-earned dollars, so I'm going to focus on that. Uh, maybe see if we can't further eliminate the, the entire amount of the state income tax on Social Security. That would be a big plus to our citizens. Those are two issues that I want to work on. And also, I continue to try to limit government spending. 
Uh, I think the big takeaway from this special session, um, there was about $781 million I socked away that did not get spent out of that $1.8 billion surplus. I moved $400 million into a, t- uh, a personal income tax reserve fund in case something would happen with the, with the tax cuts. We also prevented about $150 million of money that was uh, left to spend uh, during a special session. And we also put $231 million into the rainy day fund. So I think the big takeaway is we limited about $781 million in spending uh, just to safeguard the uh, taxpayer. Those are fiscal issues, and those are obviously very important. But education is also an important issue, and this is something that the state of West Virginia is not doing well compared to other states. And well, so the when, fiscal when, issues is why I ran. I, yes. said, I said that I was going to lower taxes and, and uh, uh, reduce spending. Those are the two issues. I've remained committed. My, my uh, record is proven. And I'm going to continue to fight for those issues that I think the taxpayer demands. Now, but Republicans, when they took over control, also talked about education reform and trying to get a handle on the State Board of Education. And there's still, obviously, a lot of work to do in that uh, field, Eric. I, I know you're not the education chairman. You're the House Majority Leader, but education is a part of that. What can we expect in this next year in regards to education reform? If you're asking me, I would say more education freedom, more school choice and also allow our teachers that are in the system today to have more freedom to teach without the burden of uh, the State Department of Education with all the regulation that comes out of the State Board. Give teachers more freedom, give them more flexibility. That's key. If you want want to see teachers compete uh, equally with charter schools and so forth, give them more freedom. Alonzo. Was there anything that you walked away uh, from the actual interns uh, feeling comfortable about moving into the next year to go into uh, the session. I know a lot of delegates, they say that the interns are basically, you know, the prerequisite to kind of line up things for next year. Is there anything that you're walking away that you feel comfortable about or think that we're going to move forward on? Um, and I'll just keep that open-ended. So I you mean, can... I feel quite comfortable leaving with giving our citizens the largest tax cut. <laughs> I mean, truthfully, yeah. uh, is there anything more that could be done? Absolutely. There's always something that could be done to give citizens more freedoms. And uh, that's, what we're, that's what we need to work on. That's what our citizens demand. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, I'm one of three recipients to have received the NRA's highest award for a citizen legislator. I've won their, uh, their, their basically their Defender of Freedom Award. I have sponsored and co-sponsored every NRA Second Amendment bill that's ever been introduced during my term uh, serving in the House. And uh, so I'm wired to, to once again, protect the taxpayers, give them the freedoms that they're looking for, and what we all desire and want. And uh, But yeah, to answer your question, Alonzo, there's always more that we can work on. Can we project any, uh, I guess, more reductions in the income tax as it stands, uh, just with the uh, financial situation that we're in right now? When the, Yes. When the CPI numbers come out in August, mm-hmm. August of next year, remember, we have the uh, ability up to a 10% tax cut minus inflation. So whatever the inflation is and the CPI numbers are uh, next August, that will determine. So if inflation is 3 or 4%, you could you have the ability to cut up to six percent because remember it's up to ten percent. So, Matt Harvey, uh, Eric, <laughs> what in your work life has prepared you to take on the role of auditor? Well, I think it's one of the role of utmost importance. It demands transparency and account- accountability. I've been a business owner for thirty five years. I retired in two thousand nineteen. I understand the importance of of writing a paycheck for someone. I understand the importance of protecting their livelihood and keeping work. Um, I've done it, you know, and um, I think that's not only my financial management background, but also my accounting background. I think it gives me the necessary skills to transition or to continue to protect the taxpayers, and that's why I'm really doing it. Eric, final word is yours. 
hey, it's going to be a good race, and I'm asking you to elect me as your next state auditor. Uh, the website's coming up. It's householderforauditor.com, where you can also see me on Facebook, uh, Householder for Auditor. So thanks, guys. Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. We'll see you guys. Bye. That is House Majority Leader Eric Householder, now candidate for auditor.